reading group his nose and I were engages they had a big plans even in bigger dreams than the birth cave and um found out Mary she meant Mary found out that she was pregnant and Jesus and Joseph was hurt confused and angry after all he knew he wasn't the father there was only one thing to do call off the wedding but weird things started happening Mary claimed she'd been visited by an angel and she'd become pregnant by the spirit the holy spirit of God Joseph had heard some wild stories before but this but this come on but then Joseph and the angel sh- sure it was in a dream, but the angel clearly said, don't break off the engagement. The child really is the savior of the world. St. Mary could no longer hide her pregnancy. People shared rumors. <sighs> rumors flew, and Mary and I and Joseph wondered what it would be like to be parents, especially of such a special child. You can read about Mary and Joseph and their son, mainly about their son, in the following pages, the story in the Gospel of Luke. It's one you won't forget. The perfect man, the perfect sacrifice, Jesus Christ, divine in human nature, life and sacrifice uniquely qualify him to offer forgiveness to all who believe. Luke appraises dates and details connecting Jesus to events and people in history. Luke's accuracy assures us that the reliability of his history of Jesus' life Caring for people, Jesus was deeply interested in people and relationships. Jesus' love for people inspires us to show the same concern for others. The Holy Spirit was present at Jesus' birth, baptism, ministry, and resurrection as a perfect example for us. Jesus lived in dependence on the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit enables believers to live for Christ. By faith, we can have the Holy Spirit presence and power to witness. This is going to be interesting reading two Bible books at the same time in the Old Testament and the New. We're going to wait until I want to read. I actually hate when it does that. It's like wasting the time on the phone, like. (laughs) The Book of Luke, Chapter 1. Introduction. Many people have set out to write accounts about the events that have been fulfilled among us. They used the eyewitness reports circulating among us from the early disciples. Having carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I also have decided to write a careful account for you, most honorable Theophilus, so you can be certain of the truth of everything you were taught. The birth of John the Baptist foretold. When Herod was king of Judea, there was a Jewish priest named Zechariah. He was a member of the priestly order of Abijah. And his wife Elizabeth was also from the priestly line of Aaron. Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous in God's eyes, careful to obey all of the Lord's commandments and regulations. They had no children because Elizabeth was unable to conceive, and they were both very old. One day, Zechariah was serving God in the temple, for his order was on duty that week. As was the custom of the priests, he was chosen by lot to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and burn incense. While the incense was being burned, a great crowd stood outside praying. While Zechariah was in the sanctuary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the incense altar. Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear when he saw him. But the angel said, Don't be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. Your wife, Elizabeth, will give you a son, and you are to name him John. You will have great joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. He must never touch wine or other alcoholic drinks. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth, and he will turn many Israelites to the Lord their God. He will be a man with the spirit and power of Elijah. He will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. 
He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, and he will cause those who are rebellious to accept the wisdom of the godly. Zechariah said to the angel, How can I be sure this will happen? I'm an old man now, and my wife is also well along in years. Then the angel said, I am Gabriel. I stand in the very presence of God. It was he who sent me to bring you this good news. But now, since you didn't believe what I said, you will be silent and unable to speak until the child is born. For my words will certainly be fulfilled at the proper time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah to come out of the sanctuary, wondering why he was taking so long. When he finally did come out, he couldn't speak to them. Then they realized from his gestures and his silence that he must have seen a vision in the sanctuary. When Zechariah's week of service in the temple was over, he returned home. Soon afterward, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and went into seclusion for five months. How kind the Lord is, she exclaimed. He has taken away my disgrace of having no children. The birth of Jesus foretold. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, But how can this happen? I am a virgin. The angel replied, The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she's now in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. Mary visits Elizabeth. A few days later, Mary hurried to the hill country of Judea to the town where Zechariah lived. She entered the house and greeted Elizabeth. At the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child leaped within her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Elizabeth gave a glad cry and exclaimed to Mary, God has blessed you above all women, and your child is blessed. Why am I so honored? that the mother of my Lord should visit me. When I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb jumped for joy. You are blessed because you believed that the Lord would do what he said. The Magnificat, Mary's Song of Praise. Mary responded, Oh, how my soul praises the Lord. How my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he took notice of his lowly servant girl, and from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One is holy, and he has done great things for me. He shows mercy from generation to generation to all who fear him. His mighty arm has done tremendous things. He has scattered the proud and haughty ones. He has brought down princes from their thrones and exalted the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away with empty hands. He has helped his servant Israel and remembered to be merciful. For he made this promise to our ancestors, to Abraham and his children forever. Mary stayed with Elizabeth about three months and then went back to her own home. The birth of John the Baptist. When it was time for Elizabeth's baby to be born, she gave birth to a son. And when her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had been very merciful to her, everyone rejoiced with her. When the baby was eight days old, they all came for the circumcision ceremony. They wanted to name him Zechariah after his father. But Elizabeth said, no, his name is John. What? They exclaimed. There is no one in all your family by that name. 
So they used gestures to ask the baby's father what he wanted to name him. He motioned for a writing tablet, and to everyone's surprise, he wrote, His name is John. Instantly, Zechariah could speak again, and he began praising God. Awe fell upon the whole neighborhood, and the news of what had happened spread throughout the Judean hills. Everyone who heard about it reflected on these events and asked, What will this child turn out to be? For the hand of the Lord was surely upon him in a special way. Zechariah's Prophecy Then his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and gave this prophecy. Praise the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has visited and redeemed his people. He has sent us a mighty Savior from the royal line of his servant David, just as he promised through his holy prophets long ago. Now we will be saved from our enemies and from all who hate us. He has been merciful to our ancestors by remembering his sacred covenant, the covenant he swore with an oath to our ancestor Abraham, we have been rescued from our enemies so we can serve God without fear in holiness and righteousness for as long as we live. And you, my little son, will be called the prophet of the Most High because you will prepare the way for the Lord. You will tell his people how to find salvation through forgiveness of their sins. Because of God's tender mercy, the morning light from heaven is about to break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, and to guide us to the path of peace. John grew up and became strong in spirit, and he lived in the wilderness until he began his public ministry to Israel. Right. Oh my goodness, I just, I don't know what I just did. I just typed in the wrong one. So Luke chapter 1 is the opening chapter of the Gospel of Luke, which provides an account of the birth of John the Baptist and the canonization of Jesus' birth to Mary. The chapter begins by introducing the circumstances surrounding the birth of John the Baptist, including in the angelic visitation to his father, Zechariah, and the promise of his miraculous birth. The focus then shifts to the angel Gabriel, visits to Mary, announcing that she would conceive and bear the Son of God. Mary humbly accepts this news and praises God in what is known as the Magnificat. Meaning Luke 1 teaches us several important lessons. Number one, divine intervention. The birth of both John the Baptist and Jesus is marked by divine intervention. In both cases, God sends his messengers to announce these miracle births that highlights the sovereignty and power of God who orchestrates events according to his divine plan. Number two, faith and humility. The response of both Zechariah and Mary showcases faith and humility. Zechariah intimately questions the angel's message and is struck mute until the birth of John, Why Mary humbly accepts God's plan for her life. These examples teach us the importance of trusting in God's promises even when they seem impossible and approaching them with humility and surrender. Number three, God fulfilled his promises. Luke chapter one, the phrase is the fulfillment of God's promises. The birth of John the Baptist and the announcement of Jesus Christ's birth are in line with the prophecies and promises found in the Old Testament by Isaiah and other prophets. This demonstrates the faithfulness of God to fulfill his word, the Bible, and show that these events are part of his larger redemption plan for humanity. And number one, here are practical applications we can draw from Luke chapter one. 
Trusting in God's plan. We should trust in God's plan for our lives, even when it seems beyond our understanding or ability. Just as Mary accepted God's plan with humility and faith, we can surrender to his will and trust that he knows what is best for us. Approaching God with humility and humble heart is receptive to God's message and open to his leading. We should cultivate an attitude of humility, recognizing our dependence on God and being willing to submit to his guidance and direction. In number three, remembering God's faithfulness, we can find assurance and encouragement in the faithfulness of God just as he fulfilled his promises in the birth of John the Baptist and Jesus. He remains faithful to his promises today. We can look back on his faithfulness in the past to strengthen our trust in him for the present and future. In summary, Luke chapter 1 highlights the divine intervention, faith, and humility in the fulfillment of God's promises, and we can apply these lessons practically by trusting in God. The plan approaching him with humility and remembering his faithfulness. May we be open to God, leading to render to his will, and rejoice in his faithfulness in our lives. Okay, and we're in Luke chapter 2. The birth of Jesus. At that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for the census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, his fiancée, who was now obviously pregnant. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her first child, a son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger, because there was no lodging available for them. The Shepherds and Angels That night, there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them. Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in the manger. Suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherds' story were astonished, but Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. Jesus is presented in the temple. Eight days later, when the baby was circumcised, he was named Jesus, the name given him by the angel even before he was conceived. Then it was time for their purification offering as required by the law of Moses after the birth of a child. So his parents took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. The law of the Lord says, if a woman's first child is a boy, he must be dedicated to the Lord. So they offered the sacrifice required in the law of the Lord, either a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. The prophecy of Simeon. At that time, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. He was righteous and devout and was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him and had revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. That day, the Spirit led him to the temple. So when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby Jesus to the Lord as the law required, Simeon was there. He took the child in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord! 
Now let your servant die in peace, as you have promised. I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people. He is a light to reveal God to the nations, and he is the glory of your people Israel. Jesus' parents were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them, and he said to Mary, the baby's mother, This child is destined to cause many in Israel to fall, but he will be a joy to many others. He has been sent as a sign from God, but many will oppose him. As a result, the deepest thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your very soul. The Prophecy of Anna Anna, a prophet, was also there in the temple. She was the daughter of Phanuel from the tribe of Asher, and she was very old. Her husband died when they had been married only seven years. Then she lived as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but stayed there day and night, worshiping God with fasting and prayer. She came along just as Simeon was talking with Mary and Joseph, and she began praising God. She talked about the child to everyone who had been waiting expectantly for God to rescue Jerusalem. When Jesus' parents had fulfilled all the requirements of the law of the Lord, they returned home to Nazareth in Galilee. There the child grew up healthy and strong. He was filled with wisdom, and God's favor was on him. Jesus speaks with the teachers. Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. When Jesus was 12 years old, they attended the festival as usual. After the celebration was over, they started home to Nazareth. But Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents didn't miss him at first because they assumed he was among the other travelers. But when he didn't show up that evening, they started looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they couldn't find him, they went back to Jerusalem to search for him there. Three days later, they finally discovered him in the temple, sitting among the religious teachers, listening to them and asking questions. All who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. His parents didn't know what to think. Son, his mother said to him, why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been frantic, searching for you everywhere. But why did you need to search? He asked. Didn't you know that I must be in my father's house? But they didn't understand what he meant. Then he returned to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. And his mother stored all these things in her heart. Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and all the people. So Luke chapter 2 continues a narrative in the Gospel of Luke focusing on the birth of Jesus Christ and the events surrounding it. The chapter begins with the decree from Caesar Augustus for census, which is required every month to go their own towns to be registered. Joseph and Mary, being from the lineage of David, travel to Bethlehem, where Jesus is born. The birth takes place in a humble setting, with Jesus being laid in a manger. Angels announce the birth to shepherds in the fields, who then go and witness the baby, Jesus. The chapter also includes the presentation of Jesus in the temple and the encounter with Simon and Anna. Luke chapter 2 teaches us several important lessons. Number one, the incarnation. Luke chapter 2 highlights the miracle event of the incarnation, where the word became flesh and dwelt among us in the form of Jesus Christ. This is profound demonstration of God's love for humanity, as he humbly enters the world as a vulnerable baby to ultimately become to himself. Number two, humility inseparably. The circumstances surrounding Jesus' birth of raises humility instantly. He was born in a stable and placed in a major, showing that God values humility and does not require grandeur or wealth to work his purposes. This challenges our cultural notions of success and reminds us of the importance of humility and contentment. Number three, good news for all. The angelic announcement to the shepherds and advice, the birth of Jesus Christ is good news for all people. This appraises the universal nature of God's salvation and necessity of his grace to people from all walks of life. It reminds us that Jesus came to bring hope, forgiveness, and reconciliation to all who believe in him. 
Here are practical applications we can draw from Luke chapter 2. Number one, embracing humility. We should embrace humility in our lives, recognizing that greatness is not measured by worldly standards, but by our willingness to serve and love others. Just as our willingness to serve and love others, just as Jesus humbly entered the world, we can seek to live with humility, putting others' needs before our own, and embracing simply. Number two, sharing the good news. The angelic proclamations to the shepherd to remind us of the importance of sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. We can not only engage in sharing the hope and salvation found in him, knowing that his message is for all people, and can bring transformation to our lives. Number three, rejoicing in God's love. Luke chapter 2 invites us to rejoice in the love of God demonstrated through the birth of Jesus. We can find joy and gratitude in knowing that God took on human form to save us and restore our relationship with him. This joy sustained us in difficult times and inspired us to live lives that reflect his love to others. In summary, Luke chapter 2 highlights the incarnation, humility, and simply in the universal natures of God's salvation. We can apply these lessons practically by embracing humility, sharing the good news of Jesus, and rejoicing in God's love for us. May we humbly embrace the message of Christ, share his love with others, and find joy in the salvation he offers. So we're going to look chapter 3. Whenever it wants to read. Chapter 3. John the Baptist prepares the way. It was now the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius, the Roman emperor. Pontius Pilate was governor over Judea. Herod Antipas was ruler over Galilee. His brother Philip was ruler over Iteria and Trachonitis. Lysanias was ruler over Eboli. Annas and Caiaphas were the high priests. At this time, a message from God came to John, son of Zechariah, who was living in the wilderness. Then John went from place to place on both sides of the Jordan River, preaching that people should be baptized to show that they had repented of their sins and turned to God to be forgiven. Isaiah had spoken of John when he said, He is a voice shouting in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord's coming, clear the road for him. The valleys will be filled, and the mountains and hills made level. The curves will be straightened, and the rough places made smooth. And then all people will see the salvation sent from God. When the crowds came to John for baptism, he said, You brood of snakes, who warned you to flee God's coming wrath, prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. Don't just say to each other, We are safe, for we are descendants of Abraham. That means nothing, for I tell you, God can create children of Abraham from these very stones. Even now, the axe of God's judgment is poised, ready to sever the roots of the trees. Yes, every tree that does not produce good fruit will be chopped down and thrown into the fire. The crowds asked, What should we do? John replied, If you have two shirts, give one to the poor. If you have food, share it with those who are hungry. Even corrupt tax collectors came to be baptized and asked, Teacher, what should we do? He replied, Collect no more taxes than the government requires. What should we do? Asked some soldiers. John replied, Don't extort money or make false accusations, and be content with your pay. Everyone was expecting the Messiah to come soon, and they were eager to know whether John might be the Messiah. John answered their questions by saying, I baptize you with water. But someone is coming soon who is greater than I am, so much greater that I'm not even worthy to be his slave and untie the straps of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. He is ready to separate the chaff from the wheat with his winnowing fork. Then he will clean up the threshing area, gathering the wheat into his barn but burning the chaff with never-ending fire. John used many such warnings as he announced the good news to the people. 
John also publicly criticized Herod Antipas, the ruler of Galilee, for marrying Herodias, his brother's wife, and for many other wrongs he had done. So Herod put John in prison, adding this sin to his many others. The Baptism of Jesus One day when the crowds were being baptized, Jesus himself was baptized. As he was praying, the heavens opened, and the Holy Spirit, in bodily form, descended on him like a dove. And a voice from heaven said, You are my dearly loved son, and you bring me great joy. The Ancestors of Jesus Jesus was about 30 years old when he began his public ministry. Jesus was known as the son of Joseph. Joseph was the son of Heli. Heli was the son of Mattat. Mattat was the son of Levi. Levi was the son of Melchi. Melchi was the son of Janai. Janai was the son of Joseph. Joseph was the son of Mattathias. Mattathias was the son of Amos. Amos was the son of Nahum. Nahum was the son of Esli. Esli was the son of Nagai. Nagai was the son of Maeth. Maeth was the son of Mattathias. Mattathias was the son of Simeon. Simeon was the son of Josek. Josek was the son of Jodah. Jodah was the son of Joannan. Joannan was the son of Risa. Risa was the son of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel was the son of Shealtiel. Shealtiel was the son of Neri. Neri was the son of Melchi. Melchi was the son of Adai. Adai was the son of Kasim. Kasim was the son of Elmadam. Elmadam was the son of Ur. Ur was the son of Joshua. Joshua was the son of Eliezer. Eliezer was the son of Jorim. Jorim was the son of Mathat. Mathat was the son of Levi. Levi was the son of Simeon. Simeon was the son of Judah. Judah was the son of Joseph. Joseph was the son of Jonam. Jonam was the son of Eliakim. Eliakim was the son of Melia. Melia was the son of Mena. Mena was the son of Mattatha. Mattatha was the son of Nathan. Nathan was the son of David. David was the son of Jesse. Jesse was the son of Obed. Obed was the son of Boaz. Boaz was the son of Solomon. Solomon was the son of Nashon. Nashon was the son of Aminadab. Aminadab was the son of Admin. Admin was the son of Arnai. Arnai was the son of Hezron. Hezron was the son of Pirus. Pirus was the son of Judah. Judah was the son of Jacob. Jacob was the son of Isaac. Isaac was the son of Abraham. Abraham was the son of Terah. Terah was the son of Nahor. Nahor was the son of Serug. Serug was the son of Reu. Reu was the son of Pelig. Pelig was the son of Eber. Eber was the son of Shelah. Shelah was the son of Cainan. Cainan was the son of Arphaxad. Arphaxad was the son of Shem. Shem was the son of Noah. Noah was the son of Lamech. Lamech was the son of Methuselah. Methuselah was the son of Enoch. Enoch was the son of Jared. Jared was the son of Mahalalel. Mahalalel was the son of Kenan. Kenan was the son of Enosh. Enosh was the son of Seth. Seth was the son of Adam. Adam was the son of God. Luke chapter 3 is a gospel of Luke that focuses on the ministry of John the Baptist and his role in preparing the way for Jesus' ministry. The chapter begins by providing historical context mentioning rulers during the time of John the Baptist's ministry. It introduces John the Baptist himself who comes preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. John exhorts that people to bear fruits of repentance and warns them of the coming judgment. The chapter also concludes John's encounter with diverse groups of people, including tax collectors, soldiers, and who seek his guidance on how to live righteously. Number three, Luke chapter three teaches us several important lessons. The one, the call to repentance. John the Baptist's ministry raises the call to repentance and the need for the forgiveness of sins. He urges for people to turn away from their sinful ways and align their lives with God's will. This highlights the importance of acknowledging our sins, seeking forgiveness, and making necessary changes in our lives to live in accordance with God's commands. 
Number two, preparing the way for Jesus. John the Baptist sees himself as the one preparing the way for the coming Messiah, Jesus Christ. He recognizes his role as the forerunner, pointing people to the Savior who is to come. This teaches us the importance of preparing our hearts and lives for Jesus, making way for his presence and sharing the good news of his salvation. Number three, living rightly and ethically. In his interactions with various groups of people, John the Baptist provides guidance on living rightly and ethically. He encourages tax collectors to collect only what is fair and soldiers could be content with their wages and not abuse their power. This highlights the importance of integrity, fairness, and ethical conduct in all aspects of life. Number three, we can learn, we can learn, draw from Luke chapter three. Number one, repentance and forgiveness. We should regularly examine our lives and not let our sins and seek forgiveness from God. Repentance involves not only confessing our sins, but also making a sincere effort to turn away from them and live in alignment with God's will. We can experience the freedom and grace of God's forgiveness as we humbly approach Him with a repentant heart. Number two, preparing the way for Jesus. We can actively prepare our hearts and lives for Jesus by seeking a deeper relationship with Him through prayer, studying His Bible, and cultivating a lifestyle of worship. Additionally, we can share the good news of Jesus with others, pointing them to the Savior who brings salvation. Living with integrity, we should strive to live with integrity in all areas of our lives. This includes being honest in our doings, treating others fairly, and using our resources and potions responsibly. Our actions should reflect the character of Christ and demonstrate our commitment to living a friendly and uprightly. In summary, Luke chapter 3 highlights the call to repentance, preparing the way for Jesus Christ and living with integrity. Um, we can apply these lessons practically by seeking forgiveness and repentance, preparing our hearts for Jesus' presence, and living with integrity and ethical conduct. May we continually to turn to God and repentance, preparing the way for Jesus Christ in our lives, and live with integrity and righteousness in all that we do. Yes. <laughs>